So if we look at what happens to this lovely light ray on the other side, it's not gonna come through at the same angle. That angle is gonna change and this angle relative to the normal we'll call theta two, and that would be the angle of refraction. And this is all governed by Snell's law. So in Snell's law says N one sine theta one equals N two sine theta two, where N one is the index of refraction of the medium you're coming from. N two is the index of refraction of the medium you're entering. Theta one here again is the angle of incidence and theta two would be the angle of refraction. So if you look, what's the biggest this angle could ever be? Say one more time. The same as the index of reflection. So, uh, I mean, even let's even change this angle sum and stuff like that. What's the biggest this angle could ever be? Because if I make it bigger than this, it's reflection at that point. So the biggest it could ever be is 90. What's the sine function look like? Yeah, it starts at zero, but by the time you hit 90 degrees, it has reached its maximum of one, right? And so I don't care what the entire rest of this graph looks like. I only have to know what the sine function looks like up to 90 degrees. And the key is from zero to 90, it only gets bigger. So as theta get bigger, sine theta gets bigger the whole bit. So if we look at what's going on with this equation, so like here, it turns out the index of refraction for air is approximately one. And here for water, the index of refraction is 1.33. So from one medium where I start to the medium I'm going into, what's happening to the index of refraction? It's going up. And so if N2 is bigger than N1, that means that sine theta one is going to have to be bigger than sine theta two to maintain this equality. That's, and air is one and water is one. Correct. So in the air above the water is one, index fraction is one, and in the water itself it's 1.33. Let's even mark that. Cool, so whichever side has the bigger index refraction is gonna have the smaller value for sine theta. And if you have the smaller value for sine theta, that means you have the smaller theta as well because we're only concerned with angles up to 90. So in this case, I saw that we were going from a smaller index of refraction to a larger index of refraction, which means we have to go from a larger angle to a smaller angle. And so it bends towards the normal. Cool. What would be true about light exiting at this incident angle here, theta one from the water. So say we've got a flashlight underneath the water. And so is it gonna to bend towards the normal or away from the normal? Yeah, so in this case, we're going from a bigger index to a smaller index, which means we gotta go from a smaller angle to a bigger angle. And so in this time, it's gonna bend away from the normal. That way, theta two is bigger than theta one. Cool. And that's how refraction works. Sometimes you gotta just identify you know, refraction patterns and which ones actually make sense and stuff, which ones bend the right way as possible multiple choice questions, things of that sort. Um, and sometimes you go from one medium to another medium to another medium and have to identify all those lovely things and stuff like that. Cool. But ultimately this is what's happening in a prism. When you shine white light, and again, what's white light? So a mixture of all the colors. So, and it turns out these indices of refraction, they're often what they're gonna give you, like this 1.33 is an average value because it actually is wavelength dependent. So it turns out if you look at all the different wavelengths of visible light, so violet being at one extreme and red being at the other extreme, and you'll find out that the index of refraction varies across that entire spectrum. And so as a result, every different wavelength is gonna bend a slightly different amount, which is why they, after they go through the prism, you see the entire spectrum of colors spread across your screen, because they've all been refracted at just ever so slightly different angles. Number one, what is the speed of light in glass with an index of refraction of 1.5? So in this case, index of refraction, again, is just the speed of light in a vacuum divided by the speed of light in your medium. If we rearrange this, we can say that the speed of light in our medium is equal to the speed of light over 1.5. And what do we get here? 
2 times 10 to the 8th. Good. 2.0 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So simple plug and chug based on the index of refraction. So question number two, a little more challenging. So the frequency of violet air, violet light in air is 7.5 times 10 to the 14 hertz. The question is what are the frequency and wavelength of this violet light in water? And the index of refraction is provided for us again at 1.33. Cool. What was that? Good. The frequency in water would still be exactly 7.5 times 10 to the 14th hertz. Again, frequency doesn't change as you go from one medium to the next. So when you think of the frequency of light, um, what is it measured in, first of all, frequency? So frequencies in hertz. Hertz. It's how frequently the light passes through a given point in a certain period of time and stuff like that. And so if you look, the light is passing with a given frequency from the air to the water, let's say, and that frequency, it's still the same frequency. So, uh, the frequency is kind of a rate at which the photons are going from the air to the water. You look at it that way and that frequency is not changing. So, the same number of photons leaves the air every second as the same number that enters the water every second. Now they slow down when they hit the water, but the same number each reaches the water each second. And that's why the frequency doesn't change. So, but because they slow down, then also the wavelength is gonna change as well. And so in this case, if you look, we said index of refraction is equal to the ratio of C over V. And if you look, the speed of light is equal to the wavelength in a vacuum times the frequency. And so we could do the wavelengths in vacuum over the wavelength in glass and the frequencies are the same and they cancel. And so you find out that this index of refraction is the ratio of, again, the speed in vacuum uh, over the speed in the medium, but it's also therefore the ratio of the wavelength in the vacuum of the wavelength in glass as well. We could have actually gone through and solved for the speeds and stuff like that, but I like just establishing this relationship instead. And so in this case, do we have a wavelength? So we're gonna to need to get one. What is the wavelength in a vacuum? So, all right, you know, I guess, you know what, if we had the wavelength, this would probably be more convenient, but it might be more convenient just to simply do this and get the V instead. My bad, let's go that route. So in this case, if I wanna get the velocity here, Speed of light in a vacuum over N. So, and we already figured this out, didn't we? Uh, no, we're in water, my bad. So what is the velocity of light in water? Anybody? 2.25. Good. Cool, and if that velocity is 2.25 times 10 to the eighth, if we rearrange this, our wavelength would equal the velocity over the frequency. So in this case, that would be 2.25 times 10 to the eighth meters per second over our frequency of 7.5 times 10 to the 14th hertz. So hertz is one over seconds, yep. It's 301 meters, right? Good. Cool, if you worked this out, you'd find out that this was roughly 400 nanometers in air. It's 300 nanometers in the water. Cool. All right, we're told if the angle of incidence of a flashlight's beam is 30 degrees into a lake, and what's the question say, number three? What is the angle of reflection? What do I give you in parentheses to confuse you? I give you the indices of refraction for both air and water. Do you need them to get the 
angle of reflection? No, it's going to also be 30 degrees. So there's a trick question. Don't fall for it. They love asking that. Number four, on the other hand, says if the angle of incidence of flashlights beam into a lake is 30 degrees, what is the angle of refraction? So now we're not going to deal with this reflected ray. We're going to deal with the one that transmits into the water. Cool. So in this case, we're going to bend toward or away from the normal. So, and why are we bending toward the normal? You're going from a smaller index. To smaller index to larger index. So we're again going to go from. A larger angle to smaller. Yep, from larger angle to smaller angle. So it's going to bend towards the normal. That way, theta two here is smaller than theta one. So definitely smaller than thirty degrees. And how do we figure out what that angle actually is? Snell's law. Yeah, we we'll just use Snell's law. So in this case, we could say that sine of theta 2 equals n1, 1, sine of 30 degrees all over n2, 1.33. And then we could take the inverse sine to get the angle. Can somebody get me a theta 2? .1. 22.1 degrees. Fantastic.